it was um, the mo it was very difficult uh, having to deal with a lot of injuries, which I am sure all of you are um, have been through or are gonna go through. I've had to uh, had three um, arthroscopy on my knee and one big ACL reconstruction, so that uh, pretty much uh, ended me. Um, I had a frozen shoulder that, that was sidelined for a year and a half. So, um, and from the neck down, I've been injured everywhere, had pins out of my ankle for nine months. So th those are some of the, the physical ailments that I had to deal with on the tour. Um, however, as painful as the physical side was, definitely loved the time that I was able to last that long in that competition mode. Um, actually, um, I played in three Olympics. Um, the first one was um, in LA, and that at the time was considered an, um, an exhibition. It wasn't officially um, the Olympic game yet. Um, and that one of the three, so I played in L um, LA, in Barcelona, and in Atlanta. Of the three Olympics, the most memorable one was actually in LA because at that time I was going to school at UCLA, and the t tournament, the tennis event, was where I was training at. So I had a lot of friends that came out um, to cheer me on. Uh, very, very honored to be inducted in the Two Hall of Fame. Um, why Hong Kong? Because that's where I grew up um, uh, in my childhood. So I was inducted in the Hong Kong and then Tennis Canada. And then um, after I retired from the tour, I transitioned into coaching. My first uh, group of coaching that I went into the level was the transition from the collegiate players to the tour right away. And as time went on, I wanted a new project. I wanted to, to test my skills as a coach. So I started my own academy with my husband. Uh, we coach from player from ground up, literally beginners, never touch a racket, all the way, uh, we had it all the way to 18th and then to the pros as well. And in recent years, I also commentated um, at the Rogers Cup and Fed Cup, completely different experience. I've never watched so many matches um, live. When I had to compete myself, I mean, you know, it's me, tactics, but there was one day I had to commentate three matches of three sets, and all three matches went to seven, six in the third. So um, I think we went, we sat there for seven hours and they just, analyzing matches and when you're a commentator you have to be interacting you can't just fall asleep so that was quite an experience um, and as Mike had mentioned I have two children of my own who are attending and um, Ohio State University they're on the men's and women's team so proud of them um, I'm also a coach mom a familiar face at tournaments um, to my kids as well um, I have a, a blog as well on patriciahe.com uh, where I share the insights um, experiences uh, and mostly related to the elite mindset which we are going to be talking about today um, and recent um, with the blogging I also started uh, presenting more um, speaking at conferences and at clubs just really to try to 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 help parents understand the development side and um, to help built a team between the parents the players and the coach so that to give the players the best opportunity that, to reach their potential and um all my tennis journey would not have been possible without my childhood coach who was my dad and as you get better as players the audience here you have your players and um you know striving to be um getting to the national level and uh, above you're going to need a team and my career my tennis career would not have been possible without a, a solid team consists actually with a very small um, solid team of my my husband and a fitness coach so thank you everybody for joining me um, today and um, I am going to give you a pause right I'll be right back Mike yes Sorry. Okay, just no, sorry, I'll be right back because I um I'm new to this, so I need to put on my presentation mode. There you go. There you go. 
Okay. Am, am I back? Not yet. Um, press screen share at the bottom. Okay, hold on a second. Sorry. Yep, this thing. Let me see here. Technical. Oh, okay. Sharing here. Just need to find my. Um, I cannot find my clip, so. How about now? No, it's not. Uh, yeah, got a little bit. I, yeah, we've got a little bit of an issue here. Sorry. No problem. All right. Hey, Isabel. Isabel. So. Right oh, there. here we go. Yep. That was working okay. for a second there. It was working. And, uh, aha. Uh -huh. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. I'm getting the hang of this. All right. Um, So today we're going to talk about, you know, jumpstart to an elite uh, mindset. And how do we exactly do that? If you are, um, if you know, I'm, I, the audience here looks like they're tennis players. So I don't know how much you are aware of the revolution of tennis. You know, there over the years now, when I was on a tour, I was in the era between after, between Chris Everett and, um, the Willem sisters. So names among my era was like Steffi Graf, um, uh, Hingis, Monica Salas, Capriati. Um, so in the beginning, you know, I started out with, with a wooden racket. And of course, you know, now, now with the racket, it's that improvement of, of the technology. It's allowing player to hit unbelievable speed with it. And then we are also, there was a revolution from fashion. Right. So as you see, um, you know, the skirt over the knees. And of course, nowadays you get, you know, um, a lot of skin showing and, um, you know, footwear also took on the revolution where it was not comfortable. Um, in fact, myself have had a lot of feet problem and um, to the point where I had to wear different shoes than the, the company that I was sponsored with. And uh, but these days the footwear is so comfortable and and has made a huge impact, saving a lot of joint problems, and the athleticism as well. A huge change in the athleticism department. Um, players didn't didn't work in in the gym, and Martina Navratilova came in, and they you know she started working out, and from there you get now on YouTube you get resources of how how to get people, players in the fittest and strongest, fastest, most endurance. So the whole dynamic of the fitness um, also took a, a change. And of course, grips in, in, in the olden days, you know, they're all about continental grips. So now you cannot get away with these uh, continental or Eastern grips because of the, the spin. It can, you cannot generate spin. The stroke itself, where you it follow through straight through, straight ahead. But now it's with the elbow up and racket down. So even the technique change, uh, data, uh, you know, first you got to uh, you know, uh, serve one plus, uh, serve plus one, or you got to finish the point um, in four. And, you know, it dictates the success of, of the point play. Whereas in the older days, they, they didn't have that. They didn't have the data. It was the coach. The coach was the data. The coach was the eyes to everything. Um, and then now, of course, if you want resources, 
uh, you know, t tennis was hardly televised. It was only Grand Slam. When I was growing up, there was just Grand Slam televised. You didn't get the tennis channel or the YouTube where the resources are abundant. And then, and then you move on to the, the roof. When it rained at events, when it rains, the, the whole match of that day, or perhaps the tournaments get canceled, but then they can't come now with a retractable roof. As soon as there's a drop of rain, they, they close that, that the roof very quickly. So why am I showing you the history of tennis? Revolution, the evolution of tennis is needed for the growth of the game to make it better all the time and to stretch us outside the box, the, 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 the level up. However, you cannot, you can have all the evolution, you can make all the growth of the equipment on the external, but all that will not work to make you a better player without working on the foundation of what the elite mind um, has to be worked on. The elite mind is not the outside factors, it's from within. So there are, um, it didn't matter if you are talking about the the um, Chris Everett when she just conquered the tour at the time, moving to um, Steffi Graf or Bjorn Borg to Pete Sampras to Nadal and Federer. Um, you know, it it they all have five common traits of an elite mindset, and that is what we are going to talk about today. All right, so these are the five traits that we're talking about that every player that wants to achieve to the highest level must learn. That, all, that goes for the, the Federer, the Nadal, the Djokovic, um, you know, and the female players, even Bianca. You know, she had to go through all that. She has to learn and she has to have it. And we're, the first trait is passion. And then you, and we're going to talk a little more in details about with with um with each pillar. Um, so the first one is passion, then obsession, obsess, and then resiliency. And your fourth pillar is accountability, and then your fifth um, pillar is attitude. We are now gonna we're we're gonna talk about passion. So what do we mean by passion? Passion is not. It's not, it's different than a hobby. Passion is something that you can't wait to do it. You, you will wake up at two, whatever time that you, that, that you need to in order to tackle the work that, that you see it as a game, not a job. Um, you know, passion gets you excited, right? And if it's not by, passion is not by convenience. It's not like, Oh well, it, it rained today, so I'm 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 gonna not do fitness, or I'm not going to do to go on the court. Passion is something deep within you that is zen-like. That that is the place, that's the go-to place where when you're sad, when you're upset, when you had a bad day, and you go to that place, you go to that place, and that's home. That's your mental home, and that's when you unleash your energy into that the project with it with that passion. Let's see. Okay. Now, where am I going to move you to? Here you go. All right. I'm moving things around here, guys, because All right, obsessed. Uh, what is what are they obsessed about? The you you have to be understand. Sorry, guys. Uh, four. So 
what are these elite minded athletes obsessed about? Um, and I can tell you right now, I am probably my kids and the players I, I work with nightmare about obsession. Um, I'm obsessed about details. I'll, you know, you'll find that elite mindset athletes are very detail oriented, very different than perfectionists. Perfectionist is just trying to find a reason to get upset when things don't go well. But detailed um, minded or um, oriented mindset is that you want to do, you want to repeat a movement. You want to repeat a thing until that you know that you are comfortable, that you are going to execute under pressure. So um, under the obsession, okay, so the you know, movement is an art. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, youngsters, average player, even the higher juniors uh, level, um, they go on the court and they just run, chase, chase balls, right? Um, movement is an art. I had the uh, good fortune of um, in Germany, this one trip with a player, and I was there for two weeks and there were pros coming in and out. I got to really see how the pros, and because I, you know, function most of my time on the women's side, but now this is the new venture for me to be observing how the men pros do it. They were focusing on split steps. I mean, every time the coach will be just on them about the split step, setting up early. They reckon it to be the furthest point before the ball comes across the net. And when they hit, it was balanced and they fo focus on follow through. If you have the, the, a chance, go on YouTube and look under practice session on Indian Wells for, for Dominic's team. You will see every step of the way was very methodical and he took the movement as an art. Um, now, why is that important? Because tennis itself is an art. art. All the skills have to be learned. And um, if you see art, then that automatically you're going to, you're going to fine tune it. You're going to draw the outline and then you're going to pay attention what needs to be done properly. You want the art of movement put you in balance so that you can counter a lot of difficult balls. Um, rhythm. Rhythm, when, you, when, when the, the pros hit, they hit with rhythm. Rhythm allows them to be able to hit the ball consistently and harder without force. And that is a lot of time when you watch the players on TV or, or in, in live, they look like they're flowing on, flowing on the court. And they, when they hit, it just looks so easy. And that is because they're in rhythm. They're not forcing anything. Um, consistency is an art. Consistency of not just getting the balls over the court consistently, but also controlling the depth the height is the trajectory over the net um you know the direction if you're in a warm-up phase you want the ball to be very close in proximity to the person you're hitting with because you're not playing points you want that that is what consistency in the pros mean it's not hitting one short ball one deep ball one left and right it's all the balls are about the same place over and over again and that takes a lot of mental awareness doing that um, also, when you go to tournaments, so what now? These are when pros go to tournaments. You know, obviously, prior to going to a tournament, they work very hard physically off the court in the gym or, or on on the track. When they go to tournaments, they actually have a maintenance program that they continue to keep to keep their body in tip top shape. To most importantly, to prevent injuries. Whereas I find that a lot of of uh, juniors don't do that when they go to tournaments. But all this, they, you have to have an obsession to be working, constantly working on yourself to be better. So when, so they're thinking every time they step on the court, at the end of practice, they want to be the better player than when they stepped on the court. So we go to our third pillar, pillar of resiliency. The resiliency of dealing with injuries and that's a physical component. You, you can't escape that. If you're playing at a high level, or, or tennis is very, a physical game, it's taxing on the body. You're going to get injuries. Now, depending on the severity of your injury, sometimes it's a career-threatening injury. And that's when you 
got to find a way. If, when you go to a doctor, like I, I said earlier, I, I had the frozen shoulder and sideline me for a year and a half. I went to seven doctors and all seven doctors said I had to have surgery. Now, at the time I was living in Hong Kong and my parents didn't believe in surgery because the x-ray didn't show any tear. And, you know, but for a year and a half, I was sidelined. I couldn't train. I couldn't practice. And then I have these doctors telling me I would be playing again. So in your mind, if that is something you're passionate about, it, it's a killer because then you, you're thinking you're losing that forever. And how I came back was we looked for doctors that we didn't want to have surgery. We, that had to be the last you think like with seven doctors that you're like, okay, that, that's uh, let's go to surgery. But we kept looking for that one doctor that would say, I will work with you. And we did find that doctor and we worked on it for a couple of months. Very painful, mind you. But I came back and had my second round on, on the tour. Um, and that's dealing with that setback. You know, the setbacks could be, you know, success. Um, it's not a straight line. It's, it's up and down and, and sideways. Um, so when you're on the momentum going up, everything's great. But what do you do when you are in this slump, when things are not fun anymore, you're not winning? That's an emotional resiliency. Or when your coach or when the coach is asking you to do a drill so to get to be a better player and you're having a tough time with that, you just want to go and embrace the things that you do really well. Well, that's human nature. We want easy. But no, if you want to be better, you always have to push yourself outside the box. And that sometimes gives you an emotional setback. But you've got to push forward knowing that, that you are going to be better. And mentally, you know, uh, proving yourself when you start competing, there are going to be people making judgment of how you play or you're too old, too young, too tall, too, too short, too small, whatever. You know what? They may be right. But you got to prove them wrong. If, if, that is, if that is something you want to do, don't let anyone stop you. And that's a resiliency in itself. And our fourth a pillar is accountability. Let's skip too fast there. So what are we going to be, what are we accountable for? You have to own your tennis. So tennis is, is you, you, if tennis is your passion, you, it's time to go to the practice. And regardless of how tough the day is, when it's snowing or, you know, raining hard or you don't feel too well, you still need to be ready to go on to do what needs to be done. We all, like I said earlier, we all want to do things that will work, that we are good at. Very few. And that's really what separates the elite mindset than the average. The elite mindset, they see it as getting better. They see challenge, challenging as a good thing. That is a privilege to be able to have this, these, these pressure. They welcome it. It's, they don't just sit there and just say, yeah, you know, I, I welcome uh, these challenges. It's like deep down, they know, A, this is what I want to do and I want to get better. And they set goals and they take ownership of what they need to do. And as you travel um, towards the greater of your, of your success, things do get more challenging. Oh, here we go. So, I, and I always say um, say this to the players and the players uh, that I, you know, I, I don't coach or whoever would listen to me. The coach is there to help. Parents cannot help you to win. Coaches cannot help, cannot make you win. And they can help to some extent of, of your progress and of your success. But you need to take ownership two-thirds two-third of what you learn. What You're going to go through your, your tennis journey with different coaches. Get the most from each coach. Don't just forget what you learned from the coach before, right? If you always have to reset your button in learning, then you'll never get to the end. You have to figure out if I'm learning on my hands, for example, with this Coach Henry, for example, I'm laying my hands, you know, feel, drop shot, slices, you know, changing, um, changing height and, and variation. You go to, to, you know, Coach Linda, and then she's like, okay, I want you to, you know, play more at the net. Well, you don't 
throw what you learn from Coach Henry, you add, you got to add on what you learn from each coach so that you can um, put a package for yourself because once you step on the court in that match, it's you and you alone and you got to figure it out. So you have to take charge, take ownership of your tennis. And our fifth pillar, to me, you can do all these things, put, you know, your passion and you are obsessed with your details and you're resilient, you know, with, with setbacks and then you have ownership. Here is the last one and I put it the last one. It's the most important one. It's attitude. I'm telling you, everybody. It doesn't matter how hard you just work on everything else. If you have a bad attitude, you will sink the ship. It will not go forward. It, you will stall at some point. Nobody, nobody goes too far for too long with a bad attitude. So get yourself together. When things are hard, embrace it because that is good news. That means you are learning. Be patient with yourself. So that concludes our um, talk for today. And, uh, you know, passion, go find one. Go find one that really gets you out of your bed, onto your feet, and do more. Do that extra mile. That's when you know you are having a passion with something. And be obsessed with the details. Don't let yourself off the hook. You know, don't take the easy way out if you want to be good. Um, and know that there will be setbacks because it's, success is not, not on a linear line. It is up and down to be resilient and take one step, in a, one step at a time when things get tough and own it. Own it because you're doing it for you. You're not doing it for your coach. You're not doing it for your parents. And most of all, have a good attitude. And good attitude to me is having fun out there. So um, if you want to contact me, Here's the information, email me, I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn as well. So I would, uh, any questions, please um, forward them. Yes, there's a good question here from uh, Raphael. He says, what do you think the negative and positive aspects of coaching your child? Having two children playing competitive tennis, has your coaching strategy changed with them? Um, the most important thing right off the bat when um, they were little, I'm talking about way back three, four years old, um, I, was, I was really focusing on values and beliefs that I could pass to them because to me that would go a much longer way. The way I was brought up, my dad uh, played Davis Cup for Cambodia and then for Hong Kong. So he, he, and he actually played a little bit on the men's satellite. He, we never, he never spoke to me about winning or losing. It was always about working hard. I only had one hour of lesson a day at the time. Um, and he was, that one hour was like most people's five hour on the court. Very intense, very focused. And when our, my, our kids came to take up tennis, that's what we did. And mind you though, we tried very hard to not have them play tennis because we wanted them that to choose tennis on their own terms. That having parents of a background like mine and my husband's, it has to come from them because pressure and the expectations are tremendous. Um, the, the, the challenging thing, uh, because my dad was my coach, so I know exactly how my, my, my kids feel, the challenging thing for your kids is they want to please you. I wanted to please my dad. So I always played my worst when my dad was around later on. And your kids, if they, they are tight when you're around, it's not because they're trying to give you gray hair. They are just simply trying to please you so much that they, they value your, what your feedback is to them. Um, from the parent standpoint, um, you know, we get to talk to them. That coaching your kids, it, it's tough. There's that fine line. You, we need, we, we very, very often, we, all the time actually, we make our kids understand that when we test up on the court, we are the coaches, and then we're off the court, we're mom and dad, and we love them to the moon and back. Very good, very good, really good information there. 
That's great. Um, I really like the part where um, you kind of referenced uh, Dominic Team and the footwork and it's it's so often I find myself using him as an example for players like I just love the way he practiced and how he pays attention to details so much you, you can see really when he practices what he's concentrating on whether it's his his strokes or whether it's his footwork you know maintaining that throughout a tournament or transition to the next tournament and and you can see it's it's I mean we've had a lot of a lot of people on our, our chat these past weeks talking about, you know, pointless hitting down the middle and so on and so forth. But you can see what these players are really emphasizing when they're practicing. So I really like that part when you brought that up. That was that was really nice. So I get a point. <laughs> <laughs> Score. <laughs> Does anybody else have any uh, questions for Patricia? If you do, you can uh, feel free to type them into the chat or you could even use the raise hand feature and I could unmute you and you could ask her personally, whatever you feel more confident with. I'll ask you one Patricia. So it seems like uh, because we have a few parents here on the chat. So um, what, what was something that you found challenging um, when you had to deal with your own kids in tennis, what was a challenge you had? They won't listen. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we, we obviously know, you know, about tennis. Um, the challenging part, you know, it, it's kind of funny because we, we, we'll be like, okay, you know what, when you, when you volley, keep the racket close to you, you know, when you short ball, you got to move through it, right? And of course, you know, in they just stick their, their their arm out and then they go to, you know, they, they go to school, right, at Ohio State. What does coach say? Keep that arm close to you, like you smell the ball, you know. And of course, immediately my son goes like this instead of like sticking his head way out. Right? So that's the that's been, but you know, it, it's natural, right? Um, this this generation has been brought up with speaking their mind. Right? Yeah. The, the, the yeah. freedom of speech. Well, right. I didn't get that luxury. I didn't get that luxury. So when my dad said, you do this, you're doing it. There is no right. ifs and buts about it. And so I find that that is the toughest thing um, is to, um, you know, not, I, I, I don't think they do it. Um, well, maybe they do <laughs> to see uh, if it's paid back time. But from my, our standpoint is that we have to find different ways to communicate to them, especially we have a boy and a girl. You cannot yes. teach them both the same way. Lingo is different. Um, the individual, right? So the way um, I, I speak with um, Isabel, for example, I, um, I need to be a little more direct because she likes direct. She likes direction. She likes us to be like, okay, tell me what and how I need to do this. Don't go and stir the pot. Whereas with Justin, it was like, huh, do you think you should, you know, come closer to the ball? Or how would you? So helping him to find his own conclusion, solution right. to, to problems. Yeah. Great. Awesome. That's great. Um, we actually have a question from uh, Doug Burke. So let's move over to Doug. Hi, Patricia. Thank Hello, you. Doug. Great presentation. Great stuff. Thank you. Uh, the issue of uh, accountability and ownership. Can you uh, maybe elaborate slightly and and you know describe some specific ways that that uh, that applies you know for um, for young for kids children as they as they're playing and training and developing. Okay, so one comes to mind, right? When you go on the court. Um, let's say you are doing cross court forehand, for example, right? There are two ways you can do that cross court forehand. Um, so let's say, uh, you know, Doug said, okay, guys, you're going to do, you know, tw 20 cross court forehand and you, you can push it. You can lob it. <laughs> you can do, you know, just get, oh, I got 20. Or you can focus on your split step. You could focus on your setting up and then impact points 
and where it's landing. Now the landing part, I would assume the coaches would, would already have targets on the course, right? Um, how, and then you have to decide, well, um, take ownership into also the consistency, right? I'll give you one trick, which don't tell anybody, only this group. Okay, you guys ready? All right. The mind, what you can do right away when you are asked to rally with somebody, you want to conquer that rally right the first ball, right? You need to show that you are the boss of your court. That means you don't miss before the person across from you. And we do that all the time. In my days, coaches didn't have to tell us. You count to 10, right? If you get a little bored um, on the court. So what you do is you go into your split step and you like take back, you know, and then now you go into the mind. You're like, okay, I'm going to go 10 rallies in a row and I get one point and I want to see how many points I get mentally. You don't have to tell anybody. And believe me, that alone requires so much focus that your brain is going to stretch so hard and you're going to become so good in your focus. Great. Thank you. That's yeah, tough. I think that's, that's a great answer, Patricia. Like just, you know, having the kids learn to kind of challenge themselves within the context that they're given. So I think that's, that's really nice. Really good. And, and, you know, like I said earlier, I, I, I am my player's nightmare when it comes to details, you know, because I, I really believe because there are a few things that get, get um, unnoticed these days or uh, put less of an importance on is anticipation. And I really, when growing up, I was taught anticipation almost immediately when I know how to rally. Anticipation of watching you know, the ball from the other side because then I'm doing my split step in the air. I have to decide, am I going right or left? Or am I going forward or backward, right? You don't have to play at a high level to see. We, we, we see when we go on the court. But the awareness to, to stretch out, a good player will see the ball or start getting ready when the ball crosses the net. The better players, the elite players, you know, it's when it comes off the racket, immediately coming off the racket, and they, they can know how to move that much quicker. Yep, that's great. Um, question from Bianca here. Uh, what were some techniques you used to control your stress and emotions during a match? So I guess maybe we could relate this to you or maybe, you know, some tricks that you use to some of the players that you work with. Uh, 17 second rules, right? Now, uh, between each point, we have 20 seconds before you actually go back and, and, and play the point. Uh, take your time, right? Uh, I would I say 17, so by the time the last ball is hit, right, you have to turn around, turn around and go five, four, three, two, one. That five seconds alone is enough to bring everything down. And by the time you walk to the tarp on purpose, whether there's a ball there or no ball there, you go to the tarp or the fence, touch it, and then walk back. So the five seconds, you actually count it in your head. You can go one Mississippi, two Mississippi, right? Okay, that counting alone helps you to um, eliminate the last shot. You know, usually if you hit a winner, you don't have to go that. You're probably, you know, fist pumping and all that. It's usually when you miss a shot. And then immediately we tighten up. Just go turn around. And I work with the players a lot on this stuff. Just turn around, hold your racket, choke up your racket, and just five, four, three, two, one. Touch the fence and then come back. That's great. Great information there. Great advice for especially for the younger players. And great question, Bianca. Um, question from Ariana here. Uh, can you talk more about your experiences with injuries and how you are spending your time to keep on improving even when you are not able to play? All right. So I'm going to pick um, the, I already told you about the, uh, the shoulder injury that I had. Um, I pick another one would be uh, my hamstring. My hamstring um, injury where it lasted six weeks. 
lot longer than I had anticipated. It was supposed to be three weeks. So during the three weeks, I, I went to rehab. However, every single day I went in the gym. So when you work, when you injured the lower um, the extremity of your body, the lower part of your body, your upper body is still available. So you could go in the gym and work out the top part. And they now have these arm bikes, right? When I was growing up, we didn't have arm bikes to work on your cardio. But work on your upper body, work on your band. The number one shoulder injury is rotator cuff issues. So I would be doing bands. Um, I had a coach, mind you though. I had a coach and we would meet up every single day. Uh, and I also did meditation. I had somebody that I did meditation with and visualization. So I did all the up here, whatever I could, um, and then the, the, the upper body strength. And when I actually injured my upper body, um, my, my shoulders, um, I worked a lot on my legs. Hamstring work, in the gym, ran, I could run. You know, so that was always uh, um, many, uh, well, not many, but a, um, a few people knew that uh, a few years ago, my son Justin uh, had a surgery on his elbow and was out for, it was estimated that he was supposed to be out for seven months. So he was already out for a year and a half um, when we came to, to Canada. So what I went to do with him was, he, I did a program for him, and then I also got a fitness coach. Uh, we couldn't afford a fitness coach every day. Yeah, as, as great as he was, we couldn't. But, but I know enough about the fitness program. So he was working out twice a day, every day, six days a week. The idea was by the time he was fit enough to come back on the court, the, the, the playing part is quite easy. It's just a matter of spending time to get your skills back. But the physical side is really difficult. So the, the plan was by the time he got back on the court, he would be ready to go. And he did. And he came back. Um, I think he won the selection of provincial right away, something like that. That's great. Really good. Really good advice. Thank you. Um, question from uh, Adamo. Uh, he says, were you ever scared of giving your kids the wrong information? Um, maybe. Um, in terms of, well, you talked about, you know, maybe they didn't always want to listen to you, but sometimes as coaches, you know, sometimes we're not sure of, of what we're relaying in terms of the message, whether it's going to help the kid or hinder the kids. So what are your experiences with this, if any? Usually the kids will listen until they're about 15 somehow that's 15 16 right because they are growing up and they're finding they're trying to find the independence right um so and funny enough that was about the same time that my dad who was my coach from when i started until i was 15 and he handed me over to Bulateri because maybe i wasn't listening anymore i don't know <laughs> but my dad was like um you know he couldn't teach me anymore so, you know, so he passed me on to Nick. Um, when Justin was 15, when he came back, started playing again. When he was 15, he was at that age, he wasn't going to listen to anybody. So we found another coach for him, but working as a team. You know, whoever coach we found, um, we, were, we were part of the team. Team is a big thing here. It takes a village to develop somebody. And, um, and we always reminded our kids. Um, you know, that we are there to support them, encourage them, and uh, we're the biggest fans and cheerleader. The only thing we ask of them is try hard. Try hard and give it the best shot. Um, if it should come a time when it's not fun and they don't want to do it, we're going to back off. That was our own con condition to them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I like how you mentioned earlier, um, you had spoken about how, you know, throughout the development process, the, the students will all have certain number of coaches at different points in their career. And, and I like how you had mentioned how, you know, Justin went off to university and the, the coach had kind of spoken to him about the volley and he had heard the same message from you guys. And, you know, maybe the bells are going off then like, oh, maybe I should try and get the impact a little bit closer to me. You know, I've heard this a few times before. so. It's always nice when we get a, another set of 
of eyes telling us the same thing. And then it kind of reinforces our belief that, oh, maybe that person does know what they're talking about. Maybe I should listen to them more often. <laughs> I tell you this funny story, though, you know, um, I was like showing Justin, you know, before he went off to um, wherever he was going off and I'm showing his volley the days when I could still volley, of course, eh? And then, he, and then um, he went home. He didn't say anything to me. He was very polite about it. And he did it. Um, it was, you know how um, when you come on the volley and that you, you get caught in that backhand and then you need to volley that, that the ball so he's curved outward with an in, inside out slice volley. Well, you don't see a whole lot of that anymore, right? So I was trying to show him that. And if he did it, he goes home and Eve tells me, my husband tells me like the next day, uh, you know that volley that you were showing Justin? He says, old school. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes to college and guess what the, co the coach is teaching him and I was like wow old school works <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's really good um do you have any suggestions for uh the students on the chat right now uh for you know some ideas of what they could be doing during this time period you know being away from you know most of us can't get out there on the courts and you know i'm sure they're all being given you know some sort of fitness program to do or something but do you have any other advice for them or any other suggestions on on you know what they could be doing to improve their their uh you know tennis iq or or whatever as, as it relates to uh their their game during this time Absolutely. And I'm going to assume the players are playing tournaments. Is that right, Mike? As yeah, competitive players competitive that, you know, players. maybe eventually want to get on to an NCAA scholarship down yeah. the road. I, I think that's, you know, the majority of the players I see on the chat kind of have this as their, their long-term goal. Okay. Uh, this is a perfect time to sit with your coach and figure out you know, two or three things that you can get better. Uh, is it your footwork? Is it getting up to the short ball? Is it tactically? Uh, are you losing your service games at four all? I, you know, so you got to really nail down what is it that you need to improve on. And then you go on YouTube with permission, of course, look up your favorite player. And look for look through matches. Get get uh, there's tons of matches out there. That's what we do here, also by the way. You know, I I, I find matches because um, you know Justin was losing his uh, service game at the first game, and when it's four all, bad timing <laughs> to lose. And um, you know he didn't really, and it it turned out he didn't really have a tactic where he wanted to serve or where he needed to serve. And so his favorite player is Dominic Team right now. Um, he, okay, so we found, a, uh, and Federer still, so we actually um, found some pool matches and had him sit through and really just look at the first game, first service game, how his favorite players were. He act, we had him charting where, it, where he, um, Federer or a team serving and when it's four all, where are they serving and what are they doing with that first ball? So now we figure out with him, it was tactic. And there was, um, he was also, the second thing that he needed to uh, work on was rhythm. Hitting with nice rhythm and, and you know, so he can laugh on the court. Um, when I took him to Germany, he was doing this cross court with a uh, former pro player who hasn't played on the tour for a long time. They went, they hit for 45 minutes just cross court. And Justin was dying. They weren't even running the whole court. But the coach was hitting with ease. He could go on for another five hours just hitting that way. It's because he understood rhythm and Justin didn't. So here we do the same thing. We find out, get two or three with your coach. What is it you need to work on? Go on YouTube, find your favorite player, and look for the specific things. And that's when you become obsessed with your details. Very specific thing to work on. That's really good. Really good advice. I, I really like the... Uh the part where you link it to the rhythm, how the coach could, could last so much longer. I mean, you would know being a coach yourself, you know, it's sometimes we can be out there for four or five hours at a time and it's okay. We, we can keep going. I mean, we're not running side to side, but we can go through the drills for hours and hours on end. And 
we get another kid out there for 20 minutes and they're gassed after 20 minutes because they're overworking, inefficient, don't, don't have the right rhythm. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a really important story. And the second important part I would emphasize is uh, work through your boredom. Because, you know, all the kids, you know, it's, it's the entertainment era, right? Everything needs to be quick and fast and now, yesterday, maybe, you know, type of thing. Work through the, the work. You know, there is nothing funny about, it's tedious, it's painful, because you have to, how many cross courts can you still hit? Millions. Right, because you want to do that, you want to work the work. The boring stuff is what most people don't want to work, but it's the boring stuff that shows up during pressure time. For example, overheads. Right, most kids don't want to hit overheads. They hit a few, and then oh, I'm done, and they go they move on. Right? If when you watch a match again, well, maybe not the pros, but in other at the tournament, right, the the junior tournament, most overheads are missed when it's pressure time. Mm -hmm. Right, you want to get to the place where when it's pressure time and you can still deliver, that's when you know you own it. Now, once you own your skill, guess what you do? You work on it some more. All right, you keep on working, and then the, the skills that need to get better. Um, you know, if my uh, if I get stretched out wide, you know, I, I slice all the time on the defense to you know and try to come back. Maybe you know, your coach might want you to like, still hit that two handed backhand, but hit it higher to buy time to get back. Maybe a little difficult in the beginning, but you've got to keep working on the liability to narrow the gap. Because the gap between and the top players now, or the juniors, the gap between their weakness and strength is not that big anymore. It used to be huge, but it's not, it, it, they narrow it now. Yeah, no, that's great. That's really good. Um, if anybody else has any questions, uh, we can take them now. Otherwise, uh, we will wrap up. And like I said, thank you all for coming out and joining. There was some, some really great information in this presentation by Patricia. Thank you so much for this, Patricia. My pleasure. Um, we will post this on oncourt.ca for anybody to review, or if you know anybody that uh, missed out that this could help out, feel free to... Uh, you know, send them over to the, the site so that they can review this and, and hopefully we can do this more often. I believe, do you have another presentation coming up? Um, I saw something for this Saturday. weekend. Okay. Yeah, so excited. So excited with this one. Uh, it's my way of uh, connecting with the tennis community and keep it fun. So what I decided was the next few weeks, I have special guests coming um, uh, to, to Speak with the audience and it'll be on this Saturday at 11 a.m. We are going to get up close and personal with uh, Grand Slam champion, double champion, and um, Pan American Games gold medalist, Gabby Dabrowski, Canadian, fellow Canadian player, who is ranked number seven on the WTA doubles ranking. Wow, that's fantastic. So yeah, I hope, uh, I hope a bunch of the people here can join in and listen in on that because that would be really interesting to to hear her perspective as well. So that's oh, absolutely really great. Yeah, absolutely. thank you for doing that. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Patricia. Thank you for, for taking the time to share this information with us and, and give this presentation. And yeah, all the best to you during during this time and, and continue on with, with all your efforts. And yeah, we all appreciate it so much. Thank you. Great. Bye everyone. Take care. Thank you, Patricia. Bye-bye. Thank you.